one, we're going to be in smaller breakout rooms, and then you'll you'll be able to unmute then and feel free to speak with those in your breakout room. Um, and also, we recommend having a paper and pen or pencil to write down your thoughts during the presentation so that when we share later, you have of that written down. So now it is an honor to introduce Jason Davis, founder of the Climate Stories Project. Um, Jason is a musician and environmental educator who holds a doctorate in music as well as degrees in music and ecology. Jason's goal is to create a living artistic documentary that engages audiences to share and listen to personal responses to climate change. The David's project, Climate Stories, have been recorded around the globe. Welcome, Jason. Thank you so much for being with us to facilitate this important workshop. And now I will turn it over to you to share your screen and get started. Great. Um, before I share the screen, just want to thank, thank you, Megan. Thanks to Mindy. I'm super excited to be here and see so many people here. Bienvenidos a los Salones de Español. And um, yeah, I'm really, really excited to do this. It's been a, a really nice journey to get to know different people through this project and people from the U.S., people from other countries. And it's, it's great to see the excitement around uh, climate storytelling. Um, I think we all know we're in a climate crisis, but often we don't know quite how to engage with climate change. It seems very overwhelming, but for me, this is a really great way to, to capture your energy and really feel part of the movement to, uh, to confront climate change. All right, so there is actually gonna be a, a icebreaker coming up in a bit, so at that point, if you wanna speak, you can unmute yourself, but we'll get there in a couple slides. All right, so I'll start sharing. Just gonna go back a little bit. Okay, so, um, once again, my name is Jason Davis. Um, I'm the director of Climate Stories Project. And um, what my best way to get a hold of me, if you want to, is just jason at climatestoriesproject.org. Um, and the website is just climatestoriesproject.org. So um, if you haven't got a chance to check out the website, I, I highly recommend it. Um, there's a lot of material there from recorded stories uh, to some music pieces I've written which use recorded stories. Um, there's a blog, there's all kinds of great stuff. So, so please have a look and um, hopefully we had a chance to follow up with everyone after the workshop as well. Can everyone hear me okay, by the way? Is the volume good? Okay, great. All right, so here's the icebreaker. Um, and what I'd like to hear is, because we're all living in these really hard times, um, we're all struggling with something, <laughs> right? health issues, uh, you know, uh, climate change, everything is, is challenging right now, I think, for all of us. But I think it's really important to uh, maintain a sense of gratitude. And so I'd just like to open it up to a few people. We won't have time to hear from everyone here, but, um, you know, four or five people thinking about something that, that in your life you're, you're grateful for. Um, I can start off by saying I'm grateful for winter. <laughs> I live in Massachusetts and, you know, I know a lot of people hate winter, but I love it. I love being outdoors in the cold weather. I love snow, so I just took a great walk today in the woods and just felt really at peace with the quiet and the, the beautiful snow and the trees. Um, so let's just hear from a few, few, few. Looks like uh, Heather, you want to share? So if you're trying to speak, you have to unmute yourself. I think you're still muted, Heather. Unmuted. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm so sorry. I'm, although I'm not driving in my car, so I apologize. I'm just coordinating that. I, I am so grateful for this evening and for the work you all are doing. Um, and because I can't stay the whole time, I, I guess I want to get to the brass tacks of my stories. I know we're supposed to have workshops later. I fear I won't be there for them. And I just want to share some of the ways the climate is impacting me right now very quickly. And I don't know if it can be incorporated later. Is that okay and appropriate or no, no good for this moment in your presentation? <laughs> well, I'd love to hear your climate story, but I think at this point, you know, maybe you could, we could talk later about sharing if you don't have time later, but maybe to share one thing you're grateful for. 
and then we can oh, again just super grateful for people like you who are making a difference and who are taking this really big problem that feels so insurmountable and helping us find those small steps towards a better way to be so thank you thank thanks you. so much Great. thanks so much heather anyone else want to share about something you're grateful for Yes, um, I'm Len Johnson. Um, I'm grateful for having uh, the ability to get outside my house and walk in nature, um, and to um, uh, and for the the scientists who are the ones who are working on solutions. I know a lot of us are trying to work on something. solutions. Sorry. A lot of us have tried to work on solutions for the, um, the 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 issues that face us as it relates to climate change, and uh, but the scientists are the ones who are going to be the ones to convince everybody else. So that's my grateful comment. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Anyone else? Looks like um, Elaine. You still there? I think you're muted, Elaine. Still muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm grateful for young people all over the globe who are leading the resistance against climate change, who are growing crops in their country, who are reforesting, who are doing all sorts of projects. I mean, if you read different magazines, which I do, you can see how wonderful it is, such as the, the trust for land, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and through the Nature Conservancy. If we don't have them leading the charge, there will be no planet because we are an older generation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Elaine. Yeah, definitely the energy of young people. I'm so, something else I'm grateful for as well. How about one more person? I uh, this is this is Larry Larry Silverstein, and um, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this. I'm grateful for the fact that I can still live in hope that we can do something before um, the apocalypse overtakes us. I don't know quite where I get that from from people like you, from others that will be at this meeting tonight. I'm not quite sure how, in spite of everything, I can feel that the end is not quite where we are yet, that there's some chance to at least mitigate what we're seeing going forward and hopefully at least stabilizing things. That kind of hope does not come easy considering everything that we see. And maybe I'm just fooling myself, but I'm grateful that I'm able to do that. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Looks, I know uh, one more person had their hand up, so maybe we'll end with uh, Marianne. Okay, so I'm Councilwoman Marianne Del Monte, and as I was going through all the people that are attending, I just am so grateful for my district for really caring so much about our pl our, our planet. I really, it, it just, it's so great because I work with all of you and. Uh, Mindy and Erin and Margaret and Patty Wood and Hilda. I just want to say, and I know there's so many others on this call and Lynn, I just want to say thank you. Really, I'm so grateful for all of you for really caring about our community. And I'm so honored to work with you and everyone on this call. Thank you. Jason, there's one more in the chat. I'm just going to read oh, um, sure. from Lynn Capuano. Um, the support and collaboration of others. I thought that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something I'm, I strongly feel good about is that, you know, despite all this challenges we're facing, we're working together, right? And without that, it would be impossible, but, but having a sense of community, having a sense of uh, solidarity in this is, is, is essential. All right, I'm sure there's a lot more we could hear, but we don't have so much time, so I'm just gonna forge ahead. Um, just to introduce myself a little bit more, um, Megan did a bit. 
So I have this kind of bizarre background in uh, environmental studies, conservation, and, and music. Um, so Climate Stories project started as a music project. Um, I just wanted to find some way to express climate change through music. Um, and there already were a lot of uh, composers, musicians using data. So they would take uh, data, uh, you know, temperature data, ice sheet data, and turn that data into like musical uh, notes, rhythms. It's called data sonification. Um, it's a very scientific approach. I think it's cool, but for me, what really gets me are uh, personal stories and narrative. So I decided to try this idea where I would uh, record people speaking about climate change from a personal perspective and then using their recorded voices in music pieces. Um, that's still continuing. That's what I did for my doctorate at McGill University a few years ago. Um, and if you want to hear some of those climate story pieces, music pieces, that's on the website, our Climate Stories Project website. I'm under the Climate Music tab. So we don't have time to really go through those now, but please check them out. I hope you, you enjoy those. Anyway, but since then it's grown, the project's grown to doing these kind of workshops, um, working with a lot of universities, working with high schools, uh, climate summits, um, just starting to work with town governments and uh, city governments, county governments, that's really exciting, museums. Um, so there's so much interest in now about climate storytelling, which is fantastic. So the project has really uh, grown quite a bit in the past couple of years. Um, okay, so here's the plan for today. Uh, we're going to talk about the impacts of climate change and how to respond to them. And uh, like Megan said, also some of the local impacts in, um, around uh, your, your local area. Uh, we'll talk about what a climate story is and why it's important to share them. Um, we'll listen to an example of one climate story. Um, and then we get to do our own climate stories, or at least start doing our own climate stories. Um, so we'll introduce a framework for climate story time. Um, then we'll just have some time to sketch out our stories, uh, share with a partner, and if you're feeling brave and excited about it, you can share uh, some of what you've brainstormed, written down for your story with the group. This is not like a finished process here. This is just a beginning into uh, writing down, figuring out our climate stories. Then we'll talk about some next steps um, going forward. All right, so I might, might be kind of preaching to the choir here. I'm, I'm not sure if everyone knows like the climate change basics, but just to make sure. Um, so climate change has happened throughout, you know, billions of years of Earth history. But at present, um, the main driver for climate change is human activity and principally uh, burning fossil fuels like coal, gas and oil, um, which we use for everything, you know, heating, transportation, electricity. It's really, really deeply embedded in, in modern society. Um, and things like wildfires, which are a consequence, consequence of climate change, but also put a lot of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, okay, so that's a big scale problem. You know, the whole point of this is to go from the, the big picture and get down to the personal, the, the, the smaller stories. Um, so some of the impacts, so this is just like the global impacts, um, sea level rise. Uh, we know that the, the sea level is rising rapidly. That's uh, from two, for two reasons. Um, one is that as water temp water gets warmer, it expands. So basically like the size of the ocean is expanding as the temperatures increase. Um, we also have uh, more um, ice melting, right? So like glacier melt has been accelerating very rapidly. And as those glaciers that are on land um, melt, the fresh water from the glacier ends up in the ocean and that eventually raises sea level. Um, you also have stronger coastal storms because um, there's more energy in the water, you have more hurricanes, you have bigger storms coming through, which is causing erosion, it's causing destruction of houses and other property. Um, heat waves is a really big one. Um, so especially in a lot of urban areas, um, because there's so much concrete, there's buildings, it uh, concentrates the heat compared to say a forest. So we've been, we've been seeing really just crazy, crazy, crazy heat waves the past 10 years, you know, just the, this last summer on the West Coast, we saw uh, Seattle 114 degrees, you know, and really insane. So this is a big health issue. Um, it's, a, it's a quality of life issue. Um, it's one of the main things we're seeing with the, with the warming climate. Um, another big one is, is uh, effect on agriculture, uh, especially drought. Um, and as we have less water for, for growing crops, we're seeing challenges in producing enough food. Um, 
We're seeing, you know, droughts, wildfires. It could have put up put up here. There's a lot of impacts. You know, these are just some of the the big ones, which most likely you've you've heard of um, to a certain extent before. So now I'm going to turn it over to um, Megan, who's going to tell us a little bit about the uh, local impacts in North Hempstead. Thanks, Jason. So um, coastal erosion is, is something we're familiar with here on Long Island. Um, we're already seeing it in North Hempstead. You can see in these photos from North Hempstead Beach Park um, that there has been significant beach loss between 1994 and 2017. So, and I'm, it's just continuing to happen throughout the years. Next slide. Um, local storms, I think everyone has had some experience with Hurricane Sandy. In the last few years, we've seemingly had a tropical storm every year. Um, and these obviously often cause effects like down trees. Um, these photos were taken from Great Neck and you could see the damage they cause. And I'm sure there's probably some people on, on the call tonight that have had experiences like this as well. Next slide. And then local flooding, uh, another big issue here. Um, again, I'm sure some people have had experiences with this and might be sharing that as part of their story tonight. Um, this can be caused by storms, by sea level rise, um, and as well as erosion of, of this, the coastlines. Um, and this picture shows how Shore Road was flooded in 2019 and there were actually swans swimming on the street. <laughs> so now I'll pass it back over to Jason to continue. <laughs> That's funny. I, I saw the picture, but I didn't even notice the swans <laughs> until, you, <laughs> until you pointed that out. I mean, it's kind of cool, but but uh, you know, scary in, in a way. And yeah. so I, I think we can see some of the, the the linkages between you know people on the West Coast, people in different countries, and what's happening in, in North Hempstead. You know, it's it's what you're seeing is unique, but also universal in, in a way, which is some of the reason that the storytelling uh, is so powerful. Okay, so ways to respond. Um, so mitigation and adaptation are kind of the two primary ways. And again, you might know all this stuff already, but um, uh, these, these are, again, the big picture. So substituting renewable energy for, for fossil energy is, is a necessary, very necessary step. Um, it's definitely gaining traction. You know, there's more and more solar energy, more and more wind energy. But, you know, the, the amount of greenhouse gases we're still producing from fossil fuels is still rising. So this transition is really not happening fast enough. Um, so this really is a, is a key goal for the, for the global picture and, and also for, for local communities as well. Um, there's, there's really direct, simple things that, that you might already be doing or know about, uh, like insulating houses. Huge issue, right? So heating buildings takes up a tremendous amount of energy and a tremendous amount of uh, fossil fuels are, are burned through that. So this is very accessible, I think, for a lot of towns. You know, homeowners can can just really do uh, more insulation and end up with you know, warmer temperatures in the winter, um, cooler in the summer, and also save energy, save energy costs and help fight climate change. Uh, another big one is, is, of course, political action, right? That can be on the local level, state level, federal level, uh, international level, uh, like the COP26 conference we had a few months ago. Um, without effective policy, we really can't do this as individuals, right? So we need all hands on deck. We need people doing their part. We need communities working together, but we also need uh, policy action from, from all levels of government. And the other side of the coin is adaptation. And um, for better or for worse, we have to adapt because uh, climate change is already happening. It's going to continue accelerating for the foreseeable future. Um, no matter how much mitigation we do, how much greenhouse gas cutting we do, we still have to do a lot of adaptation for our communities. Um, I think this piece sometimes gets lost in the confronting climate change part. Um, but for me, this is a really important part of climate storytelling is what is our adaptation story? Okay, so this can be things like uh, planting trees in, in urban areas, um, uh, very important for, for mitigating or, or reducing the effects of uh, heat waves uh, and that urban heat island effect. Um, they also do things like improve air quality in cities, which is linked to climate change. Um, some coastal areas have had to or are raising structures, right, with the flooding. Um, I know Miami's been heavily engaged with this. Um, 
because of those stronger storms and higher sea levels. And then things like uh, growing crops, which are more adapted to warmer temperatures or to droughts, for example. Um, but this is an area which I really like to emphasize and I think sometimes gets, gets a bit lost in the shuffle of adaptation. All right, so now we'll jump into climate storytelling, the focus of the workshop. Um, so this is just a little diagram I like to show at the beginning um, to show what is a, what, how I conceive of a climate story. And it's really the intersection between your life and climate change. Okay, so between your life and climate change is all these things that, that link into this network, uh, like your culture, your identity, the place you live, uh, your emotional responses to climate change, your family, what are you observing in the environment? Um, how are you responding to those changes you're seeing? Um, and so from this network, from this web, we can draw out our personal climate story. Oops, I missed a slide there. Okay, so um, what are some ways to make a really effective story? Um, the, a key one from my perspective is using I language. Um, this can be hard because we often talk about climate change like in the third person, right? Climate change is bad. Climate change is threatening this, which isn't totally valid and is, is, is necessary. But we're trying to shift the narrative to personal perspective and our relationship with the change in climate. So in order to do that, we need to use this I language. Like I remember this, I've observed this, I feel this, I'm thinking about this. Um, just having this focus consistently through your stories um, is powerful, right? So just encourage people to think about what kind of language you can use using I that's gonna be effective for your story. Um, another really important point about um, effective climate stories um, are, to use, are to use specific imagery and sensory descriptions. Um, so if you ever taken a writing class, right, it's like a show, don't tell. So it's, it's better to say, this is what I'm seeing and feeling and hearing rather than just, um, you know, in general descriptions of, of a place or a, or a scene. So, you know, a flooded area like this, you can say, wow, I really saw like the water went up right up to the top of the cars. You know, I saw um, people trying to figure out what was going on and like swimming in the water, for example. Um, the more vivid imagery you can pull out, the more specific anecdotes you can pull out of your climate story, um, uh, uh, the more effective it's, it's going to be. I've heard some incredible stories about like living through hurricanes. Um, I've heard stories about um, people just, uh, you know, having to deal with wildfires and smelling the smoke, for example. I talked to some people in California a few months ago, and that smell, right? It's not something you associate with climate change, but it's very powerful to talk about what does climate change smell like to you. Right. So think about the, using all of your senses to, uh, to really draw people into your, your climate story. So I want to play an example right now. Um, this is from uh, a young climate activist in Washington, D.C. named uh, Matt Scott. Um, he works for Project Drawdown, which is a, a really effective um, uh, climate activism group and really he, he works a lot with storytelling and encouraging climate leaders to tell their story. Um, and he also uses some really nice uh, eye language, sensory imagery, and I think it, it gives you a good sense of um, a good way to construct a climate story. So I'm going to make sure I'm sharing my sound. Yep, I'm going to play this. Hi, my name is Matt Scott. I'm 28. I live in Washington, D.C. And right now I'm actually just outside the city at Great Falls Park in Virginia. And when people think of Washington, D.C., they often think of the monuments and politics and the tourist destinations, but they won't necessarily think of all of the green areas we have. And in D.C., while I live right off of Rock Creek Park, which spans the city, and really takes up so much of the city, I actually decided to come out today to enjoy one of our other beautiful green areas. I think I first started to experience the impacts of climate change in my experience of DC in 2010 when I moved to DC because that summer, I remember getting all the text notifications about the air alerts, the air quality, about the heat. And 
that's when I first experienced, truly experienced and was aware of the impacts, but I didn't really tie back those things to climate change and a bigger problem that we could really do something about. Since my, my first summer in DC, we've had five of DC's six hottest summers ever on record. And I think that's sad. And I want for people in general, but you know, my nephew Micah, who's two years old, to grow up in a world where he could enjoy the natural environments like this and appreciate the, na the nature and plant life and animals that, that make this world so beautiful and that we often overlook. I feel hopeful as a social impact project manager and storyteller, as the climate solutions storyteller at the organization Project Drawdown, and as someone who interviews hundreds of change makers, including through Let's Care, that there are people who are out here making an impact. That energy is out there, it's something we could tap into, and it's something that I plan on tapping into and helping others tap into to make an impact because there's so many people who want to enjoy planet Earth, that want to have the benefit of this world as something that generations could still inhabit and build and benefit from and, and share with their future generations. And that's not going to happen without all of us. It's an all hands on deck effort and I'm really proud to be part of it. But for now, I'm going to enjoy this, this beautiful day. So thank you for watching and thank you for listening to my climate story. I think um, Matt Scott's story just really is, is powerful because he uses some, some real specific descriptions about where, where he is, you know, his connection to the environment. It's also a little bit unexpected, like, oh, he's in DC, but he's in this park, you know, he talks about what that means to him to be in this natural area. He talks about his, his uh, family, he talks about getting text messages, which is a little, kind of a little neat little story that you might hear. Um, so anyway, we'll talk about a bit more of what, where he's getting at with these prompts. Um, so we, uh, Hi, my name is Matt. YouTube stuff. Um, so anyway, just an example of a climate story. Um, I will encourage you to go to the Climate Stories Project website and listen to the dozens of plus stories we've, we've recorded, audio and video stories from around the world. Um, so it's a really nice resource to, to hear what's out there and, and get inspired by other people's engagement with, um, with climate change. Um, so one point I think uh, we have to emphasize is that everyone has a climate story. So that doesn't ma it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter uh, how old you are. It doesn't matter your gender. Um, it doesn't matter your, your racial background. We all have something to say about our personal relationship with the climate. Even if it's as simple as like, I'm scared, right? That's a way to build a climate story, just starting with an emotional response to climate change. Um, so it really runs the gamut from from people from all over the world and people with all kinds of stories to tell from disasters to uh, how they're getting involved to their emotions of hope and excitement. Um, there's no one right climate story, just like there's no uh, expert that has the authority to share their climate story. Okay, so you don't have to be a climate scientist. You don't have to be a politician. You don't have to be someone, uh, a climate activist per se, you just have to be alive right? and you have a climate story to share. And the, the, the work here is just to dig into it and then pull out your climate story. All right, so now we're gonna to get to um, some time to work on our climate stories. I know that was a pretty brief introduction, but um, we're gonna dig into it more with, with this prompt structure. Um, I do these prompts uh, to help you uh, formulate your climate story to give you some kind of a structure to build off of. Um, just to throw out there that it's not, this is not the, the way to tell your climate story. But over the years, I found it an effective way to encourage people to structure their stories and really make it uh, personal and effective. So we have three prompts. Um, for each prompt, we're going to take, uh, well, I'll talk about the prompt, what's involved with the prompt. Um, and then we'll take five minutes after each prompt um, for you to do any, anything you want really with the prompt. It could be just brainstorming. Uh, if you'd like to draw, I've had some amazing little uh, pictures come out of this process. Um, you can take notes. You can actually write, you know, word for word. It's not a lot of time. So it's just 
a chance to jump in and get started with your with your responses to these. Um, so at this point, you could use paper pencil. You, if you want to type on your computer, whatever works for you is fine. Um, okay, then we'll, we'll be in breakout um, groups, and um, we'll share with the partner um, for eight or so minutes, um, and then we'll come back to the as a group, and we'll have a chance to share um, if you want. Right? There's absolutely no pressure to share your your story. Um, and then I'll talk about going forward. What can we do after this workshop to continue developing and sharing uh, your story? Um, oh, and I know um, Patty is going to uh, talk a little bit about her or give her responses to the prompts um, right after I, I explain them to give her perspective and maybe inspire you to, to think of your own responses to these, um, to these prompts. Um, so the first prompt is about connection to place, which I think is a crucial part of developing your climate story and bringing in into your your life, your local uh, perspective. So the prompt is, um, what is it about your home place or, or so what is what is special to you in your home place or community and how is that threatened um, by the changing climate? Um, so there's an article by an author named Susie Wang goes back a few years, but she talks about uh, objects of care. And her point is that uh, we care about climate change, um, not because it's climate change, it's not because it's this big, scary thing, but because there's something in our life, something in our community, something in our environment that we care about that's threatened by climate change. Um, so it's identifying that object of care um, is the first step in formulating your, your personal climate story. And this really can be anything, right? It could be your family members. It could be, say, a favorite uh, state park or, or local park. Um, maybe you like to do recreational activities like fishing. Um, it could be something you might not think about, like an urban basketball court, right? And how is that threatened by climate change? Well, it's getting, we have these crazy heat waves now. So maybe your kids can't go out and play basketball in the summer like they could before. So that's something you care about, that your kids care about. That's an object of care. Um, I know for me, you know, I've been in Massachusetts for most of my life and the, and the four seasons are really important to me. Um, I really feel like an emotional connection to winter, an emotional connection to the changes of, of the seasons, like uh, spring going into summer, right? It's really exciting. It's like this dramatic uh, change that's, that adds a lot to my life. Um, and what I've seen since I was younger is the seasons kind of like flattening out in a certain way. Um, like those really big dramatic thunderstorms in the summer, we don't quite have them. It's, they're more like flat and kind of uh, washed out feeling. Um, you know, winters are a little bit more erratic. Like we have some really, really cold days and it'll get warm for like a week and, and cold again. Um, so just the quality of seasons and the seasonal change is something that I feel deeply and I feel sad about. That's my object of care. I can see how it's being affected by the changing climate. Um, and I feel really strongly about that. So, Patty, what do you, do you have a response to, uh, to this prompt? Sure, um, hi everyone. Well, I'm extremely uh, concerned about our drinking water. Uh, we, a lot of us as residents seem to assume our drinking water comes from like an endless source, but in fact, uh, we need to conserve because um, our, our sole source is from aquifers under the ground which are being strained by overuse and contamination. Um, climate change is increasing this strain by causing summer heat waves uh, that result in our overwatering, our thirsty lawns. And climate change also causes sea level rise, which um, makes us more vulnerable to saltwater contaminating our, contaminating our drinking water. So I'm really concerned about a possibility of us running out of drinking water. Okay, great, thank you, Patty. Um, yeah, so we, you know, it really could be anything. So I think now we'll just take um, five minutes to do some brainstorming and find your object of care. It could be in your local environment. It could be your family. It could be um, something unusual, right? That might not <clears throat> typically think about as this is about climate change. Um, I just wanted to ask Mindy a question. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of beeping noises from people coming in. I'm not sure if those are coming through to the to the workshop. So are people hearing like a lot of, no? Okay, I guess it's just on my end. <laughs> Good. This is your co-host. Okay, perfect. Um, 
Okay, so let's do it. And first of all, any questions um, about this? Like I said, you, anything that, that works for you, drawing, sketching, brainstorming, you know, I, I like to use colors personally, like colored pencils for whatever reason. So, um, but there's no, there's no one right way to do this. Um, any questions or confusion? No? All right, so I'm gonna set a timer um, for five minutes. And um, I'll just say when there's one minute left and just so you know to, to kind of move forward with that. So, so here we go.
So just about uh, one minute left to respond to this prompt. All right, so just a reminder, this is just to get started. I know it's not a lot of time at all. So, um, you know, you're not writing your magnum opus climate story at this point. Um, my hope is that it's a spark, you know, we're, we're gonna get started here and this is an ongoing process. Um, so we're not looking at all for like a polished climate story that's gonna publish at this point. So if you feel like it's not a lot of time, you're right. <laughs> and don't, don't worry about it. Okay, just, just, do, your, just do your best. Okay, so the second prompt is, uh, what are your emotional responses to climate change, and uh, why do you have these? Uh, why do you have these responses? Um, this is another really, really I think something that makes climate storytelling very personal. So, we often think about climate change in a very abstract way. Um, here's the science behind climate change. Of course, that's super important. You know, without climate science, we'd have nothing. Um, politics, like I said, we need we need policy, um, but we all feel something, right? All of us feel something about climate change, and usually it's a messy uh, pile of, of emotions, right? It's usually not just I feel fear. End of story. Almost always, something is going on that's hard to pin down until you really think about it or really dig into what you um, what you're feeling. It's often messy right and, and that's normal it should be kind of messy um fear clearly a a, a common emotion um with all the, the 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 potential changes that are coming down the pike and and what we're already seeing is is scary right we have to acknowledge that um grief so i think grief in general like not even just climate grief but grief as an emotion um at least in in western cultures it's often kind of hidden away Right? It's something we don't talk about. We just kind of shut, push off to the side. Um, but I know for me, I'm feeling grief over the climate crisis. Right? I feel something very, very deep with a sense of, of loss, um, very legitimate emotion. Sadness, uh, also common emotion and, and legitimate. Um, anger, I think we're often afraid of anger. Like it's not okay to be angry, right? And I really disagree. I think there's a lot of good reasons to be um, very angry about the climate crisis. Uh, one of which is that we know now that that large companies, large fossil fuel companies, have have known about the science behind climate change and the impact that their business models are having on the climate for many decades. Right, and they chose to uh, suppress that knowledge. Right, they chose to hide it from the public in order to protect their their bottom line. Okay, that that makes me very very angry, and it's it's you know hopefully we're we're starting to see some legal action to hold um, these companies to to account. Okay, we also see a lot of anger coming from younger people, um, you know, just coming into the world, becoming, finding out about where, where their place in the world is, and hey, here you go, by the way, you know, this is this massive climate change is, is on your doorstep. Um, there's really an element of unfairness, you know, injustice um, in, in there. Um, uh, confusion, right? So, uh, we're not really sure what's going to happen. It's um, it's confusing. Um, we, it's, there's a lot of ways that we don't really know how this is going to turn out. Um, for me, you know, I feel I feel love. You know, I feel love for the environment that I care about. I feel love for the seasons. I feel love for people in my life. Um, we can't forget that, right? It's not just quote unquote uh, negative um, emotions. You know, the sense of love is really important. Attachment and love. Um, hope, you know, we hear, I heard from Matt Scott, he, he does feel hopeful being in contact with all those people with energy, with uh, commitment to activism, like just seeing all you guys on this call, that gives me a sense of hope too, that there's so many people that are, that are, um, that are engaged with this, with this process. 
um, excitement, right? This is could be very exciting. We're, we're looking at a new world, potentially a new economic system, a new way of relating to the environment. And that's, that's very, um, that's very exciting. Um, and there's actually been a decent amount of research showing that uh, emotions help us make good decisions. So it's not just enough to say, we're going to rationalize our way out of the climate crisis or just, oh, we just need the right technology um, and just continue on just as we are, you know, just as we are in our society. We need to tap into these emotional responses so we have our emotional intelligence to help us make uh, good decisions moving forward. So that's really why it's so important. Um, it's really about bringing personal experience to bear on pushing the needle on the, the climate crisis. You know, and we've seen some of this with um, uh, recent social movements like Black Lives Matter movement or Me Too movement, where it's really about these personal stories and people's emotional responses to racism, right? Emotional responses to sexism. It's not just racism is bad. It's like, this is how I feel in my life about racism. And the same thing is happening with, with climate change, right? So it's not just an abstract thing. It's really part of our lives. and something that we have really deep, um, deep feelings about. Um, all right, that was a lot. <laughs> so Patty, you wanna share? Um, sure. What are your emotional responses to climate change and why do you have them? Well, I'm upset and bewildered that so many people in our country still don't believe or recognize all the signs of our earth being ravaged by the excessive consumption of mankind. Um, when I was in Africa, I saw how people were so affected by climate change with dramatic impacts, including water scarcity. Uh, little girls had to quit school to walk miles twice a day for water. Um, this instilled respect and appreciation for our vulnerable drinking water here and while there's still time. Okay, great, thanks, Patty. Um, all right, so we'll do the same as before in five minutes um, to sketch out some ideas. You know, obviously no right or wrong answers here. And um, then we'll come back and, and move on to the third prompts.
So just about one more minute for this prompt. All right, so once again, not a lot of time, but hopefully you got a little bit down about some of your emotional responses to, uh, to climate change and why you're having them. Okay, so the third prompt is um, moving forward and motivation. So why are you motivated to confront climate change and how can you contribute to a positive way forward? Um, I tend not to use the word solutions. I know it's, there's nothing wrong with talking about climate solutions. It's, it's totally valid. But it's for me, um, we're in this for the long haul, right? That we're not going to uh, get, you know, solve climate change in a way that it's going to be gone, right? So this is a generational movement. Um, we're, we're looking for ways to move our culture forward, our economy forward, our, our society forward, right? So I tend to use positive way forward um, rather than solutions. Totally fine to use solutions if that's something that, that, that works for you. Um, and the solutions and the motivation can take a, a lot of uh, a big range from political action. Um, one thing I'll mention is that um, a lot of students have used these workshops to draft letters. So um, taking their climate story and putting it into a letter to an, and sending that to an elected um, official is very powerful because it's not just climate change is bad because of XYZ. It's this is how I feel about climate change and this is what I'm concerned about and here's how I'm getting involved. Okay, so that's that can be a really effective way to link um, climate storytelling with with political action. Um, just for me, talking about climate change is really essential, right? It can be I won't, I won't say it's a taboo subject, but it's not something we tend to talk about on a daily basis. Um, we talk about the weather all the time, right? Every, every day without fail, but it's often hard to transition from, you know, the crazy heat wave into, let's talk about climate change, right? So just having these conversations with your friends, with your family um, is very powerful and is, to me, is a really important positive way forward. Um, this could be something, you know, if you have kids like, uh, or I work with a lot of students, they're doing like climate projects in their schools. Um, it could be working with uh, community energy projects, uh, community gardening. There's really no end to this, just like there's no end to your object of care. There's no end to positive way forward. Um, and the motivation piece is really important. Like a lot of people ask me like, well, what do I do if I talk to someone that doesn't believe in climate change, right? And um, it can be hard to know how to how to respond to that. What I tend to do is just say, well, here's why I care. Right? I'm not going to convince that person that climate change is is or isn't real or isn't a, 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 or caused by people. But here's what I feel. And that's legitimate. That's real. No one can argue with that. Right. So I think it's really important to to feel strong about your motivation and to communicate that with with people that you're talking to um, about climate change. Okay, so Patty, what do you what do you think for this one? Well, um, I still believe in the power of humanity. Uh, I believe there are enough of us out there that want to solve problems facing our planet and will rise to the occasion. Um, I had a fundraiser to to drill borehole wells in Africa, and I wrote a song uh, that we'll share at the end of the program, and it was to inspire people to make changes for the better. Great, thanks. Yeah, Patty, thanks, thanks for bringing that up. I mean, for me, like artistic creation is really important and I'm, I feel strongly about that. Um, how can we use creativity? How can we use the arts? Um, uh, there's lots of ways to do this, you know, rather than just say the, 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 the tried and true political action, which is we, we do need. Um, okay, any questions? If not, we'll just um, do the same. We'll have five minutes or so. 
um, to, to jot, some down, jot down some ideas about this prompt. Just about one minute left.
All right. So once again, I know it's very short, um, but I hope from those three prompts, you got at least a few ideas, a few, a little bit of brainstorming, a little bit of sketching out, maybe a little bit of writing about um, some elements of your climate story. Okay, so now it's time for partner shares. Um, so we'll be with a partner. Um, just gonna take a look at the time here. I think we'll do about six minutes. I know, again, it's not, not a lot of time, but try to do uh, three minutes or so each with your partner. Um, so introduce yourself if you don't know each other already, um, where you're from, and then just, just share a little bit about what you wrote down. I mean, it could be just improvising from your notes, uh, talking about some ideas that came up for you. Um, it could be reading directly from, from whatever you wrote down. Um, so however, however, whatever works for you to share with your partner, um, this way, everyone gets a chance to share at least a little bit during this uh, during this workshop. And then we'll come back as a group and then um, optional, you, if you want to share what you discussed with the whole group, that would be great. I could hear it too at that point. So, um, so I think Mindy is going to take care of the breakout groups. Yes, before Mindy puts everyone in the groups, I just want to share um, some directions. Um, so Mindy's going to place everyone in breakout rooms with a few other attendees. Um, once you're in the room, if you are, would prefer a Spanish speaking room, um, then please click the blue button at the bottom right corner of the Zoom window that says leave room. And once you click leave room, there'll be a pop-up that gives you a choice to leave the room or leave the meeting. So just be careful to just click the leave room, not the entire meeting button. Um, so once you do this, then uh, Mindy can place you into the appropriate room for the Spanish speakers on the call. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to put everyone in their room. Thanks, Mindy. You've all been invited. If you're still here, um, you should have been assigned a room. Do you see an invitation to a room? Hi, I may have missed that assignment. I was glancing down away from my computer, so uh, I'm not sure whether I was assigned something or, or not, but uh, maybe you can remind me. And Okay, um, I sent... I sent you to your room. It says that you got an invitation. Do you see? Yeah, some... room. Uh, yeah, I said room twenty-one. Yeah, I do see that. Okay, yeah. so then click on that. All right. Sure. Margaret, are you here? I see a lot of people still here and not in a room. So please unmute yourself and I can help you if you um, are having trouble. But all the breakout rooms are open and everyone has been assigned a room. Lynn, are you having trouble? Uh, nobody joined my room. So. Okay, I'll put you in a different room. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it looks like Peter ended up by himself in room 22 because Robert's not there. So maybe you want to put Lynn with him. Lynn Capilano moved to, which room did you say to move Lynn to? 22? Um, it just something just jumped around. So I guess we have a bunch of groups of, of three. 
Um, yeah, so, some yeah. of them. Okay. This is making it difficult to see who the Spanish speakers are too, because some people that might have left their room because they want to be placed in the Spanish speaking room. Mm -hmm. That might be part of yeah, part of it. Maybe we can put Lynn with um. Maybe like, the, the Spanish speakers, if you could like do the raise hand, so we know that you want to be placed in the Spanish speaking room, just to differentiate. That's a great idea, Lynn. Lynn is still with us. Then I'm moving you again, see if this one works. Steven, are you, did you not get an invitation to uh, join a room? Francine? I was put in a room by myself and got lonely. Okay, great. Um, Jason? Yes. Okay, sorry. All right, so let me just, Denise, I'm moving Denise to, okay. Who else do I need to move? Is there anyone else? Giovanna and Steven, I see. If you want to be put in a room, if you could just unmute yourself. Steven, did you want to be put into a room? Sure. Great. Let me just find you. Okay. You should get an invitation. Um, who else? Robert, did you want to be, and Lynn is still here. Lynn, it didn't work again? I, I haven't seen any invitation pop up. Huh. I, let me try again. Lynn. It just says, I'm trying to move you and well, since we don't have too much time, maybe Lynn, do you want to share a bit of what you wrote down with us? <laughs> since we're, it's, we're it's, okay. it's okay. I don't. I don't mind that I didn't get put in. It's okay. <laughs> um, um, but if you want me to, I can. Sure. Yeah. Go for it. It's actually um, six minutes. Do you want me to let people out, or do you want to just give it another minute? Since give we it another on? minute. Yeah. Okay. But great. It might go a little bit over, but it's not too much. Okay. Um. I guess I don't. Not don't really know where to start, uh, you know, um, the first question I actually thought was a little difficult, although the examples helped because I wouldn't say that my um, object of care is my community necessarily, but it's actually just sort of nature, nature in general. Um, but then I did talk a lot more about access to food and water. And that's, that was sort of a theme that carried through the other prompts was, um, that that um, my concern is around access to food and water for for my children in their future for all people and the threat the threat that climate change presents for that so okay, great <laughs> thank you Lynn. Maybe, maybe, maybe you want to close yeah i'll do that right now close, it'll give everyone one more minute so Oh, okay, so it's giving them one more minute. Yeah. yeah. 
That's a large part of my concern too. I'm sorry I'm not um, participating. I'm watching my small children. I have to put them to bed shortly. Oh. Problem. <laughs> but thank There's you so much for all that you're doing. We're so grateful for you. Thank you. And thank you for being with us tonight. Of course. Hopefully um, there's more like this for our community. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, this was, I'm actually gonna be running a, a sort of a similar workshop with um, te tweens and teens in about a month or so about how do you kind of um, talk about science and particularly climate change through stories and oh, conversation. So. Where can we get info for that meeting? Um, Lynn, where do we get info for that meeting? Oh, it's through actually the Queens Public Library. Is this per that particular oh, one? I've yeah. been working with them quite a bit, actually. That's funny. Did you hear yeah. about this through that? No, I heard about it through um, Transition Town, actually. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Yeah, I, we, we did like a whole series of workshops with them already. Oh, cool. cool. Yeah. I went to I one this is a workshop there. Yeah, slightly, maybe slightly different take. It's through um, the Environmental Ed Center. So, uh, yeah, Hunter's Point? Is it? Yep. Yeah, okay, wow. I, I'd like to hear more about that. I think they mentioned something about youth programming, so maybe it's maybe it's coming together there. Yeah. Um, all right, I think everyone's back, so hopefully you got a chance to, um, to share a little bit. I'm gonna stop my sh screen sharing for a sec. And um, we don't have a whole lot of time, but I'd love to hear from a few people about what came up. You know, again, this is short. This is just a little spark. It's an introduction to climate storytelling. Um, but I'm just curious to, to hear what, come up, what came up for you with the prompts and thinking about, um, about your climate story. So we should, have a time, we should have time for a few people to share. Okay, I'll, I'll start since no one wants to start. <laughs> Okay, so basically, I was in the room with Patty Katz and Aaron. Um, you know, Patty and I were, when we were talking, I was talking about how Mill Pond used to freeze over and how it doesn't do that anymore because of, um, so, and she was talking about how she used to go to Whitney Pond Park and ice skate. So it's like some of the things that we grew up with generations after us don't have which is really, it's sad because, you know, it's just, um, I, don't, I feel like it's very, very, which made me very sad. And also we talked about um, the fear of what to come. You know, what is, if we don't do something about this, there's, we're gonna have grandkids and then they're gonna have kids. And for generations, you know, we just, we have to do something for the future generations. So, um, it's just was, uh, fear was definitely one of them. Also, we didn't talk about this, but um, I have to give kudos to Mindy Jermaine on this. Many years ago, when we worked for Residence Forward together, um, she, on her own, had a group of students write letters to Dunkin' Donuts. And because of her advocacy, and she did it with Patty Wood, if Patty Wood's still on, and it was my son's grade, so it was a lot of his friends, but my son wasn't there. And we were the only town that didn't have styrofoam at Dunkin' Donuts. If you went to Manhasset, you got styrofoam. But in Port Washington, because of Mindy and Patty and these kids, they were so excited that they actually got Dunkin' Donuts to change and not use styrofoam for our um, for the environment in Port Washington. So um, I didn't bring that up to Patty, but I wanted to tell her that. That's, Thank I know you. there's other people. You're I, welcome. Patty jumped off, but I was thinking the same thing. I wanted to text her. <laughs> Great, thanks so much, Marianne, awesome. Anyone else want to share a bit? How does one share? Just, Just go okay. for it. <laughs> you can oh, raise wow. your hand, but you're talking, so you're in. Well, um, I was telling um, my partner, Jennifer uh, Senna, uh, our new uh, supervisor in the town of North Hempstead, um, about my own story about um, 
a cousin of mine sharing years ago about climate change. At, and I was 100% you know, for it. And she was, no, I don't, I don't think so. You know, and we went on and on about that, but we kind of got off it. And then recently I had a reason to talk to her and I mentioned something about climate change. And she said, you know, I'm still a skeptic. And I just thought, you know, wait a minute, this is so similar to anti-vaxxers in a way. And I think it's it's more like people just don't want to believe it. You know, they're really, I, I can't imagine any other scenario. And I guess my question to all of you is, what do we do with that? We can't yell at them or castigate them or whatever. But we have to learn how to deal with those people who are stopping good legislation from going forward etc. You know, I mean, that's on a bigger scale. But anyway, that's my two cents. Yeah, it's, it's a big topic. I and mean, I, I touched on that a little bit with like the, I'm motivated because of X, Y, Z. And sometimes that energy, you not might not change their mind, but it might spark something about, wow, this, my friend really cares about this. You know, something is there. This is, this is valuable. This is important to a lot of people. Just one pretend, I mean, people have written whole books about this topic, but that's one thing that I think can really help. Thank you, uh, Jane. How about, uh, looks like uh, Claire, you have your hand up? Yeah, actually, I wanted to, I wanted to answer Jane. <laughs> yeah. um, is when, I, I think when we, you focus on these sort of big words like climate change or the Green New Deal or this kind of thing, you just like, people just shut down. Like they just, they don't want to hear about it. They want to ignore it, whatever it is. They've got fear, whatever it is. But maybe instead you find something that you're passionate about that really you know helps mitigate climate change. I happen to be very into composting, right? So if you just tell your friend, hey, you know, if you composted, you know, that's 30% of the garbage that goes into the landfills is uh, is food waste that could be put back into the soil, you know, and and just just you know, change the I say trajectory of the conversation is something that they could help with is something they can really do that's easy to do it's not hard. Um, and they're making a difference. Uh, thank you, but I, I, I know that my cousin does, in fact, do things that are good for the um, uh, right. uh, climate, but uh, she's not a believer. And so I guess I'm thinking of it on a, a mega uh, scale yeah. <laughs> that is that, you know, that, you know, that more legislation has to be passed or something. So um, it's just frustrating otherwise. But thank yeah, you. there's a lot more we could talk about. That. I mean, one of the one of the audiences for this um, project is the huge number of people that are are concerned, but aren't engaged as much. So I think we we're, we're like really keyed up by the by the you know, people that say this is not real, it really triggers us. But that's a, a fairly small percentage of the population. So just, just to throw that out there too. But th um, think about it from another point of view though. You've got people who are used to having their garbage go away. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the compostable stuff. If you put it in the ground or in some kind of a container, it hasn't gone away. More than that, they may be uh, afraid of attracting pests, rodents and so forth. And so the easiest solution and what seems to be the neatest and most sanitary solution, one they've been brought up to believe in is get rid of it, make it go away even if it's compostable. There's this reluctance, I think, to live with what you create. I'm not just talking about the inorganic stuff, but even the organic stuff. It's so much nicer for people, I think, psychologically, to make it just go away. And you're asking them, we were asking them to do just the opposite. It's a very tough sell from a certain point of view. You know what I mean? Um, Jason, would it be okay if we um, allowed Jessica to go because I think she was translating and she... Um, sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, we might go a little bit over if that's okay with, with people, but it's fine with me. <laughs> yes, This please. will be the last one and then we'll... Yeah. Okay. Yes, Hi, please, apologies. Please. I'm like multitasking right yeah. now. Um, uh, I have uh, Natalie Rivera that wanted to share her story. Unfortunately, she doesn't have audio, uh, so I am sharing for her. Um, she says she's lived in Port Washington for over 30 years, and she's seen the growth in the population as well as the growth in the pollution that comes together with that as well. And it's been devastating for her. Uh, she's joined different um, cleanup groups uh, together with her partner, but she feels that it's not enough that the local government 
um, should help with uh, street cleaning, with uh, trying to keep the garbage out of the water. Um, and um, speaking of water, she also said that her uh, partner's grandmother lost many, many treasured things that were um, in her basement due to huge flooding and it really tore her. Um, and also it hurts to see that this happened um, to her partner's grandmother. And this is someone who lived in on Irma Avenue, by the way. Um, and that's what she, that's pretty much all she, she shared. So that's a, a point of view from someone local on how it's um, affected them. Thank you, Jessica. Jessica. And I just wanted to um, thank everyone and I wish we could just go on and on, but I know that some people have to get off soon and I want Jason to have the opportunity to talk about how you can continue to perfect and share your story. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much everyone for sharing and I apologize for not, we don't have as much time as we would like to do these, um, but there are a lot more opportunities which I'll um, finish up with a little bit. <clears throat> and maybe at the end, if people want to stay on a few minutes after, you can, because just because I know some people have to go. Mm -hmm. Yep. So just um, just to finish up here, can everyone see my screen? Yep. <clears throat> so just some reminders about developing your story. So again, this was just a little starting point. Hopefully you're inspired. You want to say, I really want to work this into a story that I can share with a lot of people and it's going to get people's attention. Um, the two points I've raised about using I statements is really important, I think, and also keying on those really specific details and sensory descriptions. So don't forget those uh, storytelling basics. You can use the prompt structure. Um, I recommend it. If you really don't uh, jive with that, that's fine too. Um, on the Climate Stories Project website, we, we don't share written stories, but we do share audio or video, uh, video stories. Um, and if you're doing one of those, it should be about one to three minutes long. It can be shorter than that. It shouldn't be much longer than, than three minutes. So, you know, on the compact side. And just like you just did, you, you're welcome to like write it out word for word, or you could just improvise it from whatever notes or drawings or images you have. Um, okay. Um, just a, little, a few tips about recording um, your audio or video stories are really basic. So there's a lot more you could read online. Um, you can use a smartphone, right? It doesn't have to be anything fancy schmancy. Like we all have phones. They all record great video for the most part um, or audio if you want to do that. I just recommend not don't do the selfie thing, right? Because it's it's hard to get a really nice image of yourself with a selfie. So use a tripod if you have one or just have your friend record your story uh, for you. Okay, that's that. Um, it's that. <laughs> so for phones, don't forget to put in the landscape mode. You'll get a you'll get a better image that way, horizontal. Um, you should try to find a quiet environment to do this. Um, years ago, when I started doing this, I would like meet people in coffee shops and then hear the recording afterwards. I was like, man, it's just way too noisy. So um, make sure you find somewhere quiet to do your your story. These are, of course, if you're doing in-person stories. Zoom stories are are a different um, different uh, topic. Okay, um, make sure you're close to the recording device for good sound quality. Usually the problem with bad sound quality is you're just too far away from the microphone. So it just sounds really distant and not strong enough. Um, you should do a test before you're doing your, your full recording. So like say, hey, my name is such and such, I'm from this place. Listen back to it or watch it and just make sure it's, it's working well. Um, you should always introduce yourself, say this is my name, this is where I'm from. Speak clearly and confidently and be yourself, right? So you're not like acting, you're just telling your story uh, confidently. Okay, so now I think we're gonna show, um, is there a question? I'm sorry, I missed in the chat. Well, if there's any questions about giving your praise. <laughs> okay, fantastic. I think, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna um, share this video and then, um, if I want to hold, I, there are a lot, that I just wanted to say that some people wound up putting their comments and stories in the chat. I'm going to download that. So that will be part of the record of this evening. So if you, um, if anyone wanted to add something to the chat while I play this short um, video, I'm going to let um, Patty introduce it while I um, pull it up. Yeah, hi, hi again. Um, this is a song that I wrote for the fundraiser 
uh, as a gift to people who donated money um, to build uh, water wells in Africa. It's called Changing for the Better. And we're just gonna play a portion of it. Thank you. Hold on one second. Should I keep talking? <laughs> yeah, give me one second. Yeah, so actually I, I did the fundraiser a year before I went to Africa and, and there's a lot of Maasai warriors in there. And one of them actually came to my house and it was a remarkable experience that we did uh, assemblies for all the different schools, many of the schools in Great Neck. Uh, are you ready? I'll stop talking, thank you. Just raise, your, tell me you can hear it. Can you hear it? Yes. Now we can't. There. Yeah. Going can in and it? out, Mindy. In and out. Um. Let me try again. Did you hit the sound button? Computer sound on when the share, when you screen shared? Hold on. Let me try this one more time. Share screen. Share sound. There it is. Yeah. Sorry. What just happened? Give me one second. I'm so sorry. Patty, I think you're on again. So I'll, I'll just say so that ex while she's looking for it, I'll, I'll fill in, I'll be a filler. Um, so that experience really actually turned me into, uh, I was always environmentally aware and always very positive about doing things for the earth. But after going to Africa, it really made me an environmental activist and that was it. So uh, it was a very powerful uh, experience for me and um, seeing the people go through the hardships that they went through uh, literally, uh, the the young girls would have to quit school for the you know at, at age of nine they'd have to stop so they could supply water for the families, and you know they would be walking through the same area that the wild animals would be walking looking for like a water hole, and um, you know they get they could be walking for five miles each way and then when they got to the water hole there'd be a herd of elephants and you know who would get the water, <laughs> so. It was very hard. They could search all day for fresh water and often it would be contaminated with malaria and things like that. Mindy, you ready for me or should I? I think that um, I'm having, for some reason, I'm having trouble with my sound. Okay, do you want, I, I could- Could you pull it up? Is that possible? Yeah. Let, let me try to find it. Yeah, I'm just, I wasn't ready, so. I'm me, sorry. Me, no, that's okay. I, just I my, got it, but my sound isn't working. Okay, hold on. I just have to find it. Should we let Jason finish first and then we can sure. do it at the end just so we can have, you know, finish and let people know how they can submit their stories? Sure. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Okay, so um, here's four ways you can get involved and uh, going forward. So one is to share your, your climate story. Um, like I said, we don't publish written stories, but if you're hopefully you're inspired and you actually want to do your own audio recording or, or video recording, um, if you're interested in doing that, if you go to the Climate Stories Project website, um, there's a, a share your story tab and it gives you instructions there. Um, there's a place to upload an audio story um, or you can just email me, right? My email address is just jason at climatestoriesproject.org. Um, I can put that in the chat again for everyone, just so you have it. And that's really easy if you're having any trouble at uh, figuring this out. I'll help you out. Um, and then um, another uh, engagement possibility is we're doing every five, six months, we do Climate Stories Ambassador trainings. Um, that's focused on interviewing other people about their, their climate story. So here we're just working in this meeting, just, just getting started with our own climate stories, but this gives you a chance to not only tell your own story, but to go out in your community or even people all over the world really through Zoom, you can interview them about their climate story and it really builds a cool connection between um, you and builds a keep sense of community around confronting climate change. If you're interested in becoming a Climate Stories Ambassador, um, go to the Climate Stories Project website. There's a registration link right there on the homepage. Um, and again, if you have questions about that, you can email me. Um, just like we've been talking about, if you're interested in creative projects uh, to, to share and get people excited about climate stories, you know, there's 
people into theater projects, music, dance, and I'm really excited about that as well. Um, and if you have an organization and you want to have one of these climate story workshops for your organization, that's a great way to um, spread the message. So like I said, we've worked with schools, we've worked with uh, museums, we've worked with conservation organizations and uh, town and city government. So please contact me if you're interested in, in hearing more about um, setting up a workshop. And that's all I had. So um, I'm ready. Okay. You ready I'm to go? <laughs> okay. yeah. Oh, it says you cannot start. To, uh, yeah, I'll stop. Maybe, yeah, you have to stop and then I can start. Let's see. Okay, thank you. There we go. Hopefully I got it. Can you hear it? Yes. I see a grove of trees thrive. Children finally laughing, taste the crystals of pure clean water. And I know our world is changing for the better. It's hard to keep the faith when so many still are dying. Live in grace when hunger causes crying. Should I keep going or just leave? That's it. You know what? Um, it's so, it's, let's just hear the whole thing. <laughs> See it. See it. Thank you, Patty. Yes, thank you very much. What a wonderful way to end the workshop tonight. Um, I just want to thank everyone so much for joining us and participating this evening. Um, I hope you all learned a lot and were really able to think about how climate change is impacting you and your community. I know I really enjoyed hearing everyone's stories and perspectives on everything. Um, 
Jason deserves a very sincere thanks and appreciation for all of the work he's put into the workshop um, in advance of the workshop, as well as doing an amazing job tonight. Um, I also want to thank Mindy for being instrumental in pretty much everything related to this workshop, including her, her amazing behind the scenes skills this evening. Um, so we encourage everyone to share their stories so we can share them with our residents um, as part of our public engagement for our Climate Smart Communities program. Um, we're gonna put, I put a link to Jason's um, instructions on the Climate Stories Project website in the chat. And we're also gonna put a link to it um, on the town's climate action web page. Um, we really look forward to hearing them and uh, using them to educate uh, and encourage everybody as well. So thank you again, and please stay tuned for further climate change related workshops that the town will be hosting soon. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Great to meet y'all. Thanks, Jason, so much. Oh, thanks, Megan. And good night. Good thank you, everybody. Patty. Thank okay. you guys for putting this together. Yeah. Thank you for coming, Marianne. Much appreciated. Bye, guys. Thanks, thanks Jessica, for the so translation much. as well. Yes, yes, Jessica, yes. very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you, Pleasure. Be well. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Yeah. Want to stop the recording, Mindy? Yeah. Recording.